carrying us into the future one second after another and on and on and on and uh, this is a time machine too designed by writer H.G. Wells to transport us to a very frightening future and for a magic ride into a happier past there's this time machine over here something very top secret something built today to recapture yesterday or explore tomorrow whichever you choose Is there really such thing as a time machine we can just hop into, roar off through the cosmic calendar in any direction? No. Well, not yet. Maybe next year. Maybe in a thousand years. No one knows. But what if we had one? Right here and now. Just imagine all the amazing things that are waiting for us out there between all the ticks and talks of time. Michael J. Fox. For the next 124th of a day, for the next 3,600 seconds, for the next 60 minutes, for the next exciting hour, you and I are going to go time traveling together. We'll turn the pages of some timeless literature, and we'll relive some famous clock-stopping moments from the movies, too. In the hour ahead, we'll examine what time is, how we measure it, and why a genius named Albert Einstein changed our whole concept of it. Everyone looks up to Einstein and no one understands him. We'll talk time travel with science fiction writers like Ray Bradbury and Robert Silverberg. A small change in the past might have colossal consequences in the future. Before we're done, we'll travel near the speed of light to slow time down and plunge into the theory that black holes in space might be used as gateways to other universes and other times. There's nothing in the theory to tell us that, that we couldn't, in fact, then travel in time. That's what that space and time inside the black hole does. It provides trips, if you like, to, to funny places. You meet Dr. Edwin Krupp from the Griffith Observatory and astronomer Carl Sagan and the imaginative movie makers behind the newest time-traveling science fantasy action comedy adventure Back to the Future. Executive producer Steven Spielberg and director Robert Zemeckis. I hope they don't think it's a movie about clocks. It'll be a movie about time. Well, the last, what was the last clock movie that made a profit? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and who knows? We might just have enough time left after all that to sneak a peek at what's really under here. Sound interesting? The trouble with everyday time is it only goes one way, toward the future. I'm kind of slow at that. Bad news for anyone who's itching to get moving and travel to where we're headed, or to where we've been. If only there were a machine that could kick the clock into high gear. If only there were a couple of knobs to turn or buttons to push so we could speed up time in any direction we wanted. Anything wrong with a Wayback Machine, Mr. Peabody? Merely changing the fan belt, Sherman. I guess we won't be going back into history then, huh? Oh, on the contrary, my boy, we're all set to invade the city of Paris in the year 1874. With all due respect to Mr. Peabody and Sherman fans, a clever dog was not the first genius to create a time machine. That distinction belongs to a clever man, H.G. Wells, the famous British writer, 
Way back in the 1890s, Wells' short story, The Time Machine, sparked the imagination of readers, and other writers, too. H.G. Wells is, I'm, I'm certain, the, the true father of modern science fiction. I, I think if H.G. Wells hadn't existed, uh, one heck of a lot of other time machines would never have been invented. Beautiful. Remarkable. Very nice, Joe. Fascinating. What is it? This is only a small experimental model, of course. To carry a man, a larger edition is needed. To carry a man? Where? Into the past or into the future? This is a time machine. In the story, Wells' hero is surrounded by friends who refuse to believe he's invented a time machine. They think he's kidding, or just plain crazy. Even though he sends a test model into the future right before their very eyes. What amazing places does H.G. Wells take us to in his machine? You'll see for yourself a little later on. But before we time travel anywhere, we've got to understand what time is. No, 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 that's not as easy or as obvious as it sounds. Time is all around us, every second of every day. We literally live our lives by it. And yet we can't see it, we can't touch it, and truth be known, we can't even comprehend it, except in the simplest symbolic terms. We speak of time as though it's something real, the, the kind of thing that, that you can package and, and promote and, and put out in, in some kind of physical way. But in fact, time is really an abstraction. It's a concept. It's an idea that our brains use in order to do something much more fundamental, and that is deal with the real things that confront us. Those are events. It's events that we find happening around us, and we organize those events in sequence according to a principle that we happen to call time. When I speak of time, gentlemen, I'm referring to the fourth dimension. If you don't mind, George, would you refresh me on the, on the first three dimensions? Suppose you explain it, Doctor. Huh? Oh, certainly. <laughs> well... For example, when I move in a straight line, uh, forward or backward, that's one dimension. And when I move to the left or right, two dimensions. And when I move up or down, three dimensions. Yes, but what is the fourth dimension? Mm, oh, well, that's it. Oh, that's mere theory. No one really knows what the fourth dimension is or even that it exists. If time truly is the unseen fourth dimension, then when did it begin? Many scientists say time started with the Big Bang the awesome explosion that created the universe billions of years ago. That's a lot of history to look back on, which is exactly what we do when we gaze into the nighttime sky. Everything we see up there is a delayed image from the past. It takes a second for light to go 186,000 miles. So clearly it takes light some time to get here from anywhere. The farther away things are, in fact, we're looking farther back in time. So, uh, like the Andromeda Galaxy, we're seeing that as it looked two million years ago. We see the sun as it looked eight minutes ago, and the moon about a second and a third ago. So an instantaneous view that we have of the entire universe of the nighttime sky is really a collection of all of these objects at once, all at different distances, and therefore all at different times. What is time? What is time? Time, as the man said, is what keeps everything from happening all at once. Okay, so the concept of what time is can really be a mind blower and no one can truly define or describe it. But measuring time, well, that's another story. Although it did take us thousands of years to get our timekeeping act together. It's a good thing we did too. Without clocks, without watches, we couldn't have evolved at all. We, uh, we would collide with each other. If man had no timekeeping, everything would happen all at once. We'd plant crops in the middle of the, the dry season, and we'd go hungry, and we would have all died out somewhere about a million and a half years ago. 
Before the dawn of civilization, primitive man's first time pieces were the sun and the moon and the very earth itself. I tell you, I have the vision sometimes of something that looks an awful lot like a chimp, you know, just watching the moon go up, there it goes once again, there it goes once again. And somewhere deep in the human past, somebody noticed for the first time that event follows event follows event, and that there is pattern and order and cycle in that. Calendars came first to mark the seasons, for planting, for harvest, for religious rites. Then clocks came clanging along in the 14th century and set the beat for human progress. As we got more complex, so did they. One thing, though. As good as our modern clocks are, they can never, ever be absolutely correct. That's because time itself isn't absolutely constant. It changes in the strangest ways. A man named Albert Einstein made sure of that. I am talking about traveling through time in a machine constructed for that very purpose. If the notion of traveling through time in machines seems impossible to you, just stop and think for a moment. Think how far we've come, traveling through space in machines. We've sent probes past Saturn's rings and onto distant stars. We've worked in orbit above the Earth, setting the stage for manned exploration of the solar system. We've even left our footprints and tire tracks in the dust of the lunar landscape. Now, just imagine how impossible all of that would have seemed 80-odd years ago when movie audiences sat wide-eyed watching a movie called Journey to the Moon. At the same time moviegoers were wrestling with far-fetched ideas of space travel, a young German math whiz was already leaping light years ahead toward time travel. He was Albert Einstein, and his special theory of relativity completely changed our view of how time works. If you leave Earth at the speed of light, he said, if you race out into space near 186,000 miles per second, then time will slow down for you. Not just a little, but a lot. A journey to another star conducted at a speed just below the, the speed of light would seem to those on board to be taking only a week or two or a month while, in fact, anywhere from four to five thousand years may be going by. And what did Einstein have to say about traveling at or beyond the speed of light? Would it stop time, throw it in reverse? No way, said the good doctor. Nothing can go faster than light. It's not as though some police officer has put up a sign and said, you know, speed limit, 186,000 miles a second. The reason that we say you can't go faster than the speed of light, we don't see anything going faster than the speed of light. And we've looked. I mean, we look all over the place for things that, that could possibly exceed the speed of light. And so experimentally, we don't find anything. Einstein's special theory of relativity only permits time travel into the future. But what about going backward as well as forward? Well, some scientists believe that two-way time travel is possible inside one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. Inside black holes. Nobody's ever seen a black hole, but evidence is they do exist. There are stars that have burned themselves out and collapsed inward to create a center so dense and gravity so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. Now, the theory says that a black hole might be like a cosmic drain, sucking up whole chunks of our universe and shooting them through to other universes and other times. If we could figure out a way of moving into uh, the, a particular zone in this black hole and, and coming out again, there's nothing in the theory to tell us that, that we couldn't, in fact, then travel in time. That's what that space and time inside the black hole does. It provides trips, if you like, to, to funny places. Clearly, we're dealing with some very exotic physics and some very extreme circumstances and some technology that is, is well beyond anything that, that we can practically imagine now. Whether we use black holes someday or, or machines or whatever, you and I may have to wait a while before we can actually physically travel back and forth in time. But that's okay, because we already have another easier way to visit any part of time we like, whatever we like. No, not inside 
this machine inside this one the imagination i think there is no limit to the imaginative speculating mind uh, that's the wonderful thing about really good science fiction that it takes you to the limits of the universe and beyond right on through our own bodies are time machines that carry us from one moment to the next but our minds can imagine times that are far in the future and times that are far in the past modern science fiction writers like ray bradbury and robert silverberg have made time travel a permanent part of our literature but they were the first to journey in and out of the pages of time some of history's best authors have done their share of time traveling too like washington irving with rip van winkle and charles dickens with his classic story a christmas carol the time travels of ebenezer scrooge Confronted on Christmas by his long-dead partner, Jacob Marley. Get ready for ghosts, Marley warns. They're coming to show you the evils of your past, present, and future. It's all humbug, I tell you! Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I do, I do, I do. The drifting back in time to look at what happened and to see what mistakes were made. That's essentially a science fictional concept. Are these the shadows of things that must be? Or are the only shadows of things that might be? In the end, it's a ghostly visit to the dark future, not the distant past that turns old Scrooge around. One look at his own tombstone, and suddenly it's Mr. Nice Guy. Generous, thankful to be alive, worthy of a second chance in the world of the present. I must stand in my head. I must stand in my head. <laughs> a peek at the future. It's almost everybody's dream. And Charles Dickens knew it, just as all good fiction writers do. There's only one thing we ever talk about. Every day, every hour of the day, every minute of the day. That's the future, isn't it? What are you going to have for lunch? What are you going to have for dinner? The immediate future. Who are you going to fall in love with? Who are you going to marry? How many children are you going to have? Always the future. That's all we ever talk about. So no wonder science fiction is important. Of all the writers who set our imaginations free to wander through time, one still stands apart from all the others. Our old friend H.G. Wells. And let's face it. He gave us the original literary hardware back in 1895, and it hasn't worn out yet. When Herbert George Wells first wrote The Time Machine, he hated it. He didn't like the style, the concept, or the characters. So he did the whole story over again. And in the process, he gave human imagination a way to break through all the barriers of natural law right on into the fourth dimension of the mind. Thirteen years have passed. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. And then suddenly the light was gone. What had happened? In the year of 1917, I stopped. <laughs> you look rather silly without your mustache, old man. Were you addressing me, sir? Philby, it's George. Well, I must say, I expected a little more enthusiastic a greeting. I think you're confusing me with my father, sir. Yes, there was quite a resemblance. Were you a friend of father's? Yes, sir. He was killed in the war a year ago. I was, I think, ten when I came upon this book, and I had learned by then I wasn't going to live forever. I was not going to see the 23rd century, let alone the year 40 million. Wells handed it all to me. H.G. Wells' view of the future was grim, and the time machine reflects it. His hero crash lands in the year 800,000 and finds that mankind has become a timid, ignorant tribe. The world is ruled from underground by savage cannibal monsters called Morlocks. There's no happiness ahead for the human race, said Wells. None at all, in the end. Well, it wasn't a pretty picture, but to me it was, it was a revelation. Uh, the book itself was a time machine, and I wanted more of that. I wanted to see everything. I wanted to, to visit the future. If H.G. Wells hadn't existed, 
uh, one heck of a lot of other time machines would never have been invented. I think each one of us, as we grew older, has tried to do a variation on his time machine. From the turn of the 20th century on, no one needed a crystal ball to predict that H.G. Wells' writings would have a lasting impact on the world. And it came as no surprise when time travel in books soon led to time travel in the movies. One of the most imaginative and appropriate films is Time After Time. Malcolm McDowell is young H.G. Wells himself, off to the future in his own time machine, in fictional hot pursuit of Jack the Ripper. It's an action thriller that finds Wells 80 years out of sync and smack in the middle of a museum exhibit about himself. Mommy, come over here. Mommy, who's that man? Jason, come away. He probably works here. Hey, you. Get away from that exhibit. Where do you think you are? Disneyland? Pardon? What a charming idea that the young H.G. Wells actually has a time machine and uses it to come into our era. And then, of course, to go chasing around after Jack the Ripper. It was, it was all manner of things tied together beautifully. How wonderful for H.G. Wells to have had a chance to see the 20th century of our, of our time. What, a, what a, a glorious gift to him if we could only have done it. Order of fries and a small coke to go, please. Give me a Big Mac, fries, and tea to go, please. And come back with me. Back? Yes. Back to 1893. During his stay, H.G. falls for bank teller Mary Steenburgen, a lady far more liberated than anything he's used to. I'm a 20th century woman. I have a career and a mind of my own. Be reasonable. How am I going to make it in 1893? In 1946, Jimmy Stewart jumped into time traveling of a far different kind. In the Frank Capra classic, It's a Wonderful Life. The story of George Bailey, a small town banker facing jail, Saved from suicide on Christmas Eve by Clarence, his guardian angel. Yeah, so you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, eh? I wish I'd never been born. Oh, you mustn't say things like that. You... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. Clarence arranges for George to see the future as it would be if he'd never existed. And of course, everything is different. The one sleepy little town has suddenly gone all wrong, and its warm-hearted people have turned as cold as stone. Because without the good nature of George around, the world is a far less happier place to live in. This, this is George. I thought sure you'd remember me. George who? George Bailey's trip through time is only make-believe, but the lesson he learns from it is as real as real life itself. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? These are powerful mythic concepts. The notion of finding out what what has happened while we weren't looking? What happened in places that we never could perceive or never will perceive? That, that questing notion of moving through the universe, moving through space and time to see what we don't see before our noses. There's just no limit to the fantasy ways movies use to travel through time. Sheer willpower and self-hypnosis do the trick for Christopher Reeve in Somewhere in Time. He's Richard, a 1970s playwright in love with the picture of a 1912 actress, Jane Seymour. Totally obsessed by her beauty, Richard decides to project his mind back in time to meet her. Evening, Mr. Kenner. He dresses the part and casts away all signs of present day. 
Then he locks himself in a hotel room to think his way into the fourth dimension and into the arms of his long ago lady love. The first thing I intend to do for you... I've already done. Well, the second thing, then. What? Buy you a new suit. I don't understand. Nobody seems to like my suit. Well, can you blame them? Oh, wait a minute. I think my suit is terrific. Going back to 1912 is hard to do, but staying there is even harder. All it takes to break the magic time-traveling spell is an unexpected reminder of where our hero came from. Oh, yeah, this is the best part. This is a special coin compartment for emergency. Richard, you're Richard. Richard! Richard would have been much better off with a time machine. They're more reliable. Yeah, except, of course, the one that Buster Keaton got stuck in his head during a side trip into TV's Twilight Zone. The helmet was supposed to take Buster to a quiet and restful destination in the future, but instead dumped him in a modern world that was too busy making progress and noise and pollution to ever let anybody relax. Back to the drawing board, Buster. What kind of time machines are movie makers building to send audiences of the 80s into the fourth dimension? This is it, right here. The movie's called Back to the Future, Hollywood's latest time travel fantasy, and comedy, and action adventure all rolled into one. The story of Marty McFly, a 1985 teenager, accidentally propelled back to 1955, where he winds up in high school with his parents, before they were his parents. What are you writing? Science fiction stories. Get out of town. I didn't know you did anything creative. I just think the movie is so rich in story and so rich in sort of, you know, occurrence. It's just got everything in, in it. You know, it's like somebody brought a big dumpster with good ideas and backed it up and poured them all through my window. I mean, Back to the Future to me is like the greatest Leave it to Beaver episode ever produced. It's got all the, those great beaverisms, you know, it's got all, all those great situations. It is so much of, a, of an excursion into the ultimate imagination. If Marty McFly looks kind of familiar, you're right. It's me, back in the fourth dimension, years before I was even born. And how does our hero get to where he's going in time? In this. The most fantastic, flashy, four-wheel time machine in the history of movies. One that might even make H.G. Wells green with envy. In Back to the Future, the time machine is the homemade brainchild of Doc Brown. Marty McFly's eccentric inventor friend. Behind the scenes, though, in real life, it's a modified DeLorean sports car, the creative work of some of movie making's best special effects people. One of the large projects that we've had to do here for Back to the Future has been the DeLorean time machines. We were provided with three DeLoreans, and we immediately tore into them, tearing them apart, tearing the rear decks out, tearing the engines out, changing the tires, adding all sorts of electronic parts, glowing bands of neon that dim and brighten. We've got all sorts of LED readouts on the, on the speedometer. We've got the fire that comes out the tires. We've got large exhaust that comes out the vents. All this work is to provide a very interesting vehicle for the characters in the movie to go back and forth in time. We thought it, if we're going to build a time machine, it should be mobile. So the obvious thing, if you can fit it into, would be to build it into a car. It seemed like a particularly American idea. Uh, given our love affair with the automobile. We went out and, and uh, bought parts and junkyards and stuff like that and, you know, attached them to the car and said, you know, that looks good or that doesn't look good or let's put some lights here. It's very important for us to have it look like Dr. Brown actually built it in his own garage. 
And that was the key, is that we wanted to, to look homemade. So when you see the time machine, there's soldering weld marks on it, wires are taped on, uh, stuff is just really kind of done together with uh, spit and sealing wax, which is the way real inventors throw things together. The whole idea was to make Doc Brown's DeLorean look a little dangerous, even though it really wasn't. I mean, we're talking movie magic here, and blasting back 30 years through time is supposed to be a very serious, risky business. Or is it? Okay, here's what I want you to do now. I want you to look like you're really nervous. Okay. So you look out that way. See? That way. That's right, that's right. You're looking out there, and your motivation is that you're about to go back into time. Got that? Good. Okay. Here we go. One of the trickiest things about making Back to the Future was recreating the same single town in two different decades, 30 years apart. It meant that a whole movie company had to transport itself and its collective imagination through time in both directions at once. So much has changed when you start going back 30 years that it took a lot of construction and of course the obvious things like period cars and wardrobe and, and, and things like that. But I think the fun in our movie is that you'll see everything in the 80s and you probably won't be paying a lot of attention to it and when you go back you'll see everything but it's all been changed do you know where 1640 rivers you're gonna order something kid uh yeah give me give me a tab tab i can't give you a tab unless you order something right give me a pepsi free you want a pepsi powder you're gonna pay for it so when I see movies about a period, you know, a period in history that's before my time, you sort of like you subtly get educated by things, and you say, "Wow, they didn't." Yeah, like you say, they really didn't have sweet and low. And my God, look at that! You needed a bottle opener to open up a, a bottle of, uh, of Pepsi, you know. And it was like that was the kind of thing that you you, you forget about, and that we're you know hopefully we'll reteach the younger audience about, and the older audience will sort of have a nostalgic sort of memory of that my job would be is to show to design the contrast into the show to show the very strong differences between the 1985 look and the 1955 look and consequently when you do all this detail it takes a lot of time and a lot of you know money when the overall ambiance is there it catches the flavor and feel of the period don't have nobody to call your magic beam, Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. At the heart of Back to the Future is the old and bewildering question, and that is, if we can go back in time, can we also change the shape of things to come once we get there? Heads up, green deck, land aircraft. Oh my God. Suppose a modern U.S. Navy aircraft carrier steamed into a strange magnetic storm. And suppose that storm sent the carrier back in time. Back to December 1941, directly into the path of the Japanese fleet, on its way to attack Pearl Harbor. Now, if you were the skipper, would you sink the Japanese and completely change history? Or would you move aside and let Pearl Harbor happen right on schedule? That's the classic time-traveling dilemma Kirk Douglas, James Ferentino, and Martin Sheen confront in the sci-fi adventure movie, The Final Countdown. Every man on this ship knows that we have radar and visual contact with the Japanese fleet approaching Pearl Harbor on December the 6th, 1941. Now, what do we do about it? Skipper, what we do about it is blow them out of the water. The USS Nimitz declares war on the Japanese Empire? That's what we've been doing. But they haven't attacked Pearl Harbor yet. The only evidence we have that they intend to is in the history books. It opens up some amazing possibilities. Think of the firepower of the USS Nimitz back in 1941. What kind of possibilities, Mr. Lasky? Possibilities for the future, Mr. Owens. Think of the history of the next 40 years. Could a time traveler really alter history, either on purpose or somehow by mistake? Well, that's a question that's puzzled scientists, writers, and movie makers for a long time. 
Astronomer Carl Sagan recently showed us just how hard the answer is to come by on his TV series, Cosmos. We travel into the future, although slowly, all the time. But what about the past? Could we journey into yesterday? Many physicists think that this is fundamentally impossible, that there is no way we could build a device which would carry us backwards into time. Some say that even if we were to build such a device, it wouldn't do us much good, that we couldn't significantly affect the past. For example, suppose you traveled into the past and somehow or other prevented your own parents from meeting. Why, then you would probably never have been born. Which is something of a contradiction, isn't it, since you're clearly there. Go to it, kid. In Back to the Future, Marty McFly faces Dr. Sagan's time paradox, making sure his parents get together in high school in 1955 so that he himself will be around come 1985. Yeah, there's somebody I'd like you to meet. Lorraine? Oh. I'd like to meet my good friend, George McFly. Hi. It's really a pleasure to meet you. How's your head? Oh, uh, good. Fine. Oh, I've been so worried about you ever since you ran off the other night. Are you okay? Oh, it's Marty. Sorry, I have to go. Come on! Isn't he a dreamboat? Doc, she didn't even look at him. This is more serious than I thought. Apparently your mother is amorously infatuated with you instead of your father. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. Doc, are you trying to tell me that my mother has got the hots for me? Precisely. A small change in the past might have colossal consequences in the future. And the time machine parable showing the small changes leading to great changes through tinkering in the past is a valuable thing for us to, to know and to, to ponder. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? In the movie version of Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, a little tampering with the past saves some valuable heads for the future. Hank, the time traveler, played by Bing Crosby, has been sentenced to execution, and so is King Arthur. But Bing and the King aren't dead yet. Not as long as they've got a farmer's almanac from Hank's home base in time, the early 20th century. Suppose you thought I could extract another miracle from my book of wonders? It's taken an awful big stunt to get us out of this. It'll take just about the biggest... Wait a minute. If I remember right, what day is this? The 21st day of June in the year 528. I think then, sir, I have your miracle. Now listen, all of you. Unless the king and I and the rest of these prisoners are freed immediately, I shall blot out the sun and it will never shine again. <laughs> all right, very well. You ask for it then. Now, with a few well-chosen words, I shall blot out the sun forever. Walla Walla, Washington! <laughs> obviously everyone's fantasy to say boy if I could go back in time I could really uh, rule the world I'd know everything that was going to happen and I could do anything I want I could set myself up as a god knowing what history is before it happens can go a long long way towards saving your skin when you travel through time and back to the future proves it in 1985 Marty McFly takes his skateboard for granted 
But when bullies are out to beat him up 30 years earlier, it's a different story. Skateboards don't even exist yet. Until Marty discovers he'd better invent one. And fast. smart bunch we human beings we've learned how to cross space with our math and our engineering and slowly but surely we're learning how to move across time as well first with our minds our imaginations our books our movies and our dreams the ones we share with the hg wells and einsteins of the world dreams that might one day give us a real machine to tame the fourth dimension and all the dimensions beyond it of course, it doesn't much matter how we travel through time, just as long as we do it. To keep the past, present, and future in proper perspective. And what will we find on the other side of the time barrier? Nothing much. Just the most incredible adventures you could possibly imagine, that's all. And uh, all the time in the world to live them. Hey, I had to know. I've been there.